Ruiz. Welcome back to the next part of this Truth and Rhythm episode. Be sure to subscribe to this channel. If you've already done so, please share it with friends. Also become a member by joining Truth and Rhythm on Patreon or consider donating at funkinstuff.net. Thank you so much for your interest and support. Enjoy. Hey, before we get started with today's show, I just want to draw your attention to new merchandise. Funkin' Stuff and Truth and Rhythm designs are in, and they look pretty darn cool. So show your support, help support the program, and show off some stylish merchandise and apparel. Only at the Funkin' Stuff store. How, how would you um, describe how he struck you overall and, and, and the summation of all your exposure to Prince that you had. Prince was okay. Okay. Boom. Here's the first story. When I was about 15, 16 years old, I told my mom, I remember it was on my front porch. I told my mom, I said, mom, one of these days I'm going to meet Prince. She said, why you say that? I said, cause I had a dream last night. And what was the dream? The dream was I was at the Grammys and I was looking from the back where the people sit that ain't got no money. I was sitting way back in the back and I was looking down front and me and Prince were getting up from our chairs, sliding out to go accept the Grammy. And she said, well, be careful what you wish for, son. You might get it. But don't be surprised if he's not who you think he is. That's what she told me. Right? So... Anyway, fast forward, it wasn't with Prince. The exact, exact situation happened with Jimmy Vaughn. We won a Grammy in 2001. Exact situation. Now, and for those who, let me make, for those who think I'm fronting, that's me. That's the Grammy. Do you get the blues? <laughs> okay. Just, I always keep it right there where people think I'm fronting. I ain't got a front. So, um, and I wrote, probably total of six, seven songs for Eric Gale's last two albums, right? So, anyway, um, fast forward, I win the Grammy with Jimmy, I become friends with Prince. And here's what I learned, or well, friends, I mean, Prince didn't have no friends, but let's, to surmise who Prince was to me. He was a brother. He wasn't a friend. You know how some people are your friend and, and if you got a blood brother, you basically got to deal with them. Whether you like them or not, you got to deal with them. But your friends, you don't have to deal with them. You deal with them because you want to. Prince was one of those kind of guys that if we, all of us viewed him as our brother, not our friend, not our business partner, none of that, right? We viewed him as our big or little brother, right? And he was that brother who, if you didn't watch closely, he'd find a way to fuck you. Because <laughs> that's just who he was. He had no choice. It was built in, right? So there are, there are stories, there are circumstances, there are situations, there are occurrences, there are accidents, mishaps, misfortunes. There are things that we, when I say we, I'm talking about the community of us who knew him personally who are inside his inner circle, right? There are stories we will never tell anybody we'll take to the grave. And I'm one of those people too. There are stories I know about Prince and his associations with other people and other things I will never speak on, right? Because it wasn't mine to speak on. 
I was like, if I was to write a book, it'd be called A Rockstar Adjacent. Because there's so many things that happen in history when it comes to Prince, the revolution, the time that I was like, this is what this is Prince and the time and revolution going on. And here, here's me right off camera. <laughs> if they'd have panned. You ever, you ever see that movie Zelig? Like that. I, I mean, you, if you pan left or right, you'd have seen me somewhere in there. Or something like when, when Eddie Murphy and Charlie and Big Fruity and all them guys were playing against Prince and Mickey and all them. I got a call that next day talking about that game. Talking about that game the next day. Right? The whole, the whole, um, historic legend of Prince and uh, Sinai uh, O'Connor. I, I know that whole story. I know the whole story. I know what's real and what ain't. But that's not mine to tell. Right? I, again, Brown Mark. Everything Brown has done since the time he joined that band almost, I know the real stories. All the Maserati stories, I know them all. The time. Morris Day. Morris Hayes was in the time. Most people don't even know that. Morris Hayes was in the time. <laughs> right? Morris has played with everybody in this town. <laughs> right? Because he's the greatest. You know, when you're that good, you play with people, especially when you're a go-getter. Right? It just is, man. I mean, Morris and I came here and shook the world. And, and nobody, nobody knows who we are. They know who Morris is. But Morris is just like me, very unassuming. That's not even relevant or important. Just like people say, man, you got a Grammy, and that's so cool. I said, man, a Grammy may as well be a bowling trophy if you can't turn it into some money. I just happen to have been able to turn mine into some money. I got songs on TV commercials. I got songs on TV shows, right? I got a song that's getting ready to come out on this year, 2021, 2022 Fox Sports season. I make my living doing things musical, but outside of music as well, because music is a fickle mistress, man. You starve to death screwing around with music. <laughs> my son, I do everything I can to teach him not to be a singer, but he can sing his little ass off. Right? At three, he can, he can you sing a song that he knows, he's going to sing it on key, in pitch, in timing, and ad lib, and every now and then he'll take the same melody and he'll write another song from that wow. right yeah. like like london bridge is falling down i'm about to tie my shoes tie my shoes he'll do that i mean so he's a much better musician than i ever will be i'm glad that was passed on for you for me i can't stay in tune singing it's always been my achilles heel but i'm glad my son can so yeah you know it skipped a generation your dad probably could too <laughs> better than me that's for sure my grandfather could too yeah see that's what that's how it goes man it's genetics it's, it's genetics it's in the dna but it's also in the spirit realm right before he came here before he was literally born inside his mama i used to take al green and you know isaac hayes dvd or or on my phone and i take the headphones and put them on her belly like that click and he would listen to that stuff and he started kicking a little bit then he'll calm down go to sleep He's been listening to all that stuff since he's a baby. We, we, we took cool. my son to Prince shows while wow. he was in my wife. And uh, he's actually named after, his initials are MPG. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. You just cursed him for life. <laughs> well, I didn't want to curse him by naming him Prince. Prince, right. <laughs> right. So I made him more subtle. You know? Yeah. That's what Michael, that's what Michael did when he named his son Prince. He was trying to, he was jabbing at Prince. Hey, you my son. You my boy. <laughs> right? That was all it was. So, yeah, man. I mean, I, and again, a lot of the stuff that has happened in my life happened for, out of happenstance, which is no such thing, really, but um, it had divine intervention. It had nothing to do with me. And the things that had to do with me were just a simple matter of showing up, you know, being on time, being where I'm supposed to be when I'm supposed to be there. So, you know, I toured with Jimmy Vaughn. I was living in L.A., right? Went to L.A. to record and never recorded one second while I was there. How did you make his acquaintance? Well, I was in L.A., and one of my buddies, two of my buddies sang with Jimmy at the time. Charlie Red, 
who's with the Full Flavor Kings right now, and um, and Freak Juice with Morris Day and the Times guitar player Tori. Tori was in Austin too, and his band was getting their butt kicked by our band every week. <laughs> okay, so. <laughs> Yeah, I hope he gets to see this. He won't see this. I don't want to watch that stuff. You ain't got no juice. All right, so anyway, so um, um, Charlie and Rayvon Foster were both in Jimmy's band, and they were looking for a third singer. And while I was living in L.A. working at a television production company, right, working with, you know, Russell Simmons and all this stuff, right? And... Um, Rayvon gives me a call and said, man, it's too bad you got that job in, in, in L.A., man, because Jimmy's looking for a third singer. You'd be perfect. I said, listen, here's what you do. You tell Jimmy his third backup singer is on the way to get that job. So when is the re when is the rehearsal? When can I show up? And they told me when it was. So I quit the job, started packing up my stuff in L.A. I'm breaking my lease. I'm doing whatever, whatever I need to do. I'm getting out of here. Right. I fly to Austin. I go to a bar where my boys are hanging out when we're, we're playing, you know, I watch them play a set in. And then the next day I went to Jimmy's rehearsal and so I'm here to get my job. And Jimmy's like, that's pretty confident. <laughs> so I said, nah, but I, you know, I think I, I think I fit, you know, so let's see what happens. So they, they sent me some songs I was ready, right? I met Stevie before I even knew who Jimmy was, right? So it was, that was a long time ago, that was in Austin. but. But I auditioned, Jimmy said, yep, yeah, yep, yeah, you got the job. So I took the job and we toured. We went around the world twice. And then while we were on the Autobahn in Germany, in a tour bus doing 175 miles an hour, <laughs> okay? We were on the tour bus and Jimmy's manager at the time comes to the back of the bus where we're all hanging out, you know, chilling, acting stupid. He says, Jimmy's looking for some new songs. He got a new record label. And he needs some new songs for his new album. Anybody got anything? Submit it as soon as you can. I said, all right, guys. So I went, got up in my bunk, got my little micro recorder, and started writing. I gave him five songs that day. Four of them made the record. So, that, and then, you know, he won a Grammy. I went to L.A. We did the thing, and I've been touring with him ever since. I haven't played with him in a while now because he hasn't been really touring that much. And when he was touring, he wasn't taking singers. The last time I, I went with him and, and was, as a singer was probably three three years ago, something like that. Yeah, my son was a baby last time I was on tour with him. And um, yeah, and I didn't really want to be on tour that much anyway because I wanted my son to, I wanted to watch him grow up. I didn't want to show up and he, oh, you're awfully big. How old are you, two? Dad, I'm 12. <laughs> I didn't want to be like that, right? <laughs> so like on, uh, like on Talladega Nights, Man, you're big. What are you like, six? <laughs> I'm in eighth grade, dude. Ooh, I gotta lay off that peyote. <laughs> so, so yeah. I mean, so I've been finding ways and methods to make money. You know, business consulting and stuff like that. And you know, have you ever performed uh, with Eric Gales at all? Or just oh yeah, oh yeah. Eric, like I said, I've known Eric since before he was born. Right. I tour. I gigged with his brother. And I've done some stuff with Eric. Eric sat in with my band a few times uh, here in Minneapolis, uh, G Sharp in the Business. And uh, Eric's a monster. He's the best guitar player ever. He's I don't great. care what anybody says. I don't care what you think. My favorite living today, for sure. Yeah, he's the best living guitar player on earth. And his brother is as good, if not better, because he taught him. And his brother played bass with him with Eric Gale's band. Well, I, was, I just learned recently that Eric can play some drums and bass too. Eric can do anything, man. You don't see, you don't know that family. Uh, they've got three. They've got two, two brothers that have passed away, and all of them are talented. All of them, little Jimmy King, Sammy Gales, all of them, crazy talented. Crazy. They're all left-handed. Oh uh, man, I'm telling you, church kids, man. All of them, crazy talented. I'm talking. I'm talking gifted, yes, yeah. gifted, yeah, not just can play, but gifted, left-handed, upside down, channels through those guys. It's nuts, dude. <laughs> it's like nuts. kind of like it channeled through Prince, you know. Again, again, and and if Prince had had children, there's no way 
their kids, his kids would have been plumbers and, and you know, laying tile and shit. Because you don't, I mean, what do you do? I said the same thing to the to the to everybody in the Steele family here in, in town. I said, man, if I was in y'all family, man, I'd be a bricklayer or, or plumber or something. I wouldn't want to be in the family of all you bad motherfuckers. Because, <laughs> you know, at the Petersons, the same way. I mean, how do you, come on. You know, I'm just lucky I'm the only one in my family that could do something. Right? So... It's G. What was what would you say? Can you think of like the most amazing thing musically you ever saw Prince do? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the most amazing thing that I've ever seen Prince do in my life was, and he invited me to be a part of it. That's what makes it amazing for me. I get a call two o'clock in the morning. He used to do it all the time. G, come out to Paisley. Or Morris would call. G, come out to Paisley. Right? One of the two. He calls me out. I get there. And this is in the small room. Now it's all decorated up and looking all cool or whatever. But it was just a regular little room. It was full of people. And on that small stage was Prince, Larry Graham, Butch on keys, Cynthia, Jerry, um... Sly's sister, uh, it was basically Graham Central Station and Sly and the Family Stone on stage, and they asked me to come out to sing the Sly shit. And we played basically a full Sly and the Family Stone set, and I'm singing all the Sly stuff. I could have died and gone to heaven that day. But what made it so dope was Prince had to, when he was around people that he, he was into, right, he became one of us. He was just a guy in the band. And he could flip it just like that. Like one night he had me come out. It was raining. No, it was snowing. It was freezing cold snowing. It was Easter weekend. And it was freezing snow. And I was with my ex at the time and her family. And I said, I'm going home, man. So we were going to go home. Morris calls me. Prince wants you to come out, man. I said, what? It's Easter. He said, I know, I know. He's got he's doing his thing tonight and he wants he wants you to come out. I said, okay, fine. Well I ain't I ain't parking in no lot and taking no van or none of that kind of stuff. Open that back. Tell who who's in the back. Tell them to open that gate. When they see me pull up, open that gate. I'm parking down in the back, and that's the only way I'm doing it. He said, Let me call you right back. He called me back. He said, done. So I go out there. I go in. This is when Prince had the bad hips. Right, he before he couldn't get a surgery, right? So what, he what year about? Um, oh God, I don't know. It was when he was wearing the white furry boots, right? In the nineties, yeah, early two thousands. Early two thousands, okay. And his hips were bad. He had a cane. He was walking, kind of limping with a cane, and they were playing out there. And Elson Morris had the big church hat, the big lady church hat on stage, and Maceo was in the band, and all those guys were playing. And I'm sitting there on the side stage at Paisley, right? You know, if you're looking at the stage, to the right was the side stage where everybody sat. And the sound men were over there. And the crowd was there and they blocked off. You couldn't go back there. So I go in. I go back there. Security takes me back there. And I'm sitting back there with Mike and Sonny. So me, Mike, Sonny are sitting back there on the side stage watching the whole show. So they're grooving. It's killing, right? So Prince comes off stage. And he's got the mic in his hand. He comes off stage. He puts it in front of Michael Bland's mouth. Michael, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> come on, Sonny, sing. Sonny didn't want to sing nothing, right? So he said, go get him, G. He just tossed me the mic, just like that. Go get him, G. So I grabbed the mic, went up on the stage, rocked the house, and I was getting ready to break it down. I broke it down. Boom. And all of a sudden, I heard, do, 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 Prince is playing bass for me. <laughs> so Prince is playing bass and we going to skin tight and make sure da, 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 the whole thing and I'm saying well you know bad bad miss <laughs> it was awesome so again Prince had the ability to be the man and in a second flip to be the man sitting next to the man because he was a band dude when it's all said and done yes he's iconic he's iconic he's on the level of 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 Elton John, Sting, Jeez. Bruce Springsteen, the Beatles, the Stones. He's on he's up in Elvis. 
Michael Jackson, Michael, Prince Michael Jackson Elvis, everybody else, right? But he was a band dude, period. When it was all said and done, he was a band dude. He was a player. And if you couldn't play, he didn't want to mess with you. I don't care who you were. And matter of fact, if he knew you were weak, he would expose you just to show how weak you are. Like when he put Bruce up on stage, that's Bruce the player's guitar solo. Or when he worked with Lenny. He worked with Lenny just to show how weak Lenny was compared to him. Or he brought Kim Kardashian up on stage. Oh, yeah, just to kick her off stage. Yeah, yeah. period. He knew he was going to kick her off stage when he brought her up. Because <laughs> he knew she was going to get up and try to be all cute. Mm -hmm. You better get off my stage with that nonsense fake booty. You better get out of here. <laughs> right? I'm old school. I want no fake booties. <laughs> right? So, yeah, and he was that dude, too. He was... When it all said and done, he was straight up hood. He he was all beautiful and blah, 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 you know, for his crowd. But when you got one on one and he took all that off, right, he was uh, hood. Yeah. He was hood. He would say some hood shit all the time. All the time. I mean, I loved him. I mean, we all did. And anybody you love, you're going to have that love hate. Absolutely. I never hated him because I never. I worked for him when, when when my band opened for him with Carmen Electra in my band. That was cool, right? But when that was over, it was just over. And I never sought any more work with Prince from that point on, right? Well, I didn't even talk about that, but that's nothing to talk about. But yeah, Carmen was in my band. And we toured the world with Carmen Electra. She was horrible. She's a cute girl, you know, but... It was some some decent, decent, there were some decent tracks on her record. Though. Yeah, but you can get anybody a good track. That's, you know, that means nothing. But when you're on stage, when you break it out, when you get on stage, and the audience is like, yeah, whatever. Right? That's that's when, you know, and that's when we had to go home. It's a business. I'm a businessman. He sent us home so that the rebel, so that his band, the MPG, could be her band, hoping that would help. That didn't help either. Right? So, I mean, I love her. She's cool. I haven't spoken with her in a thousand years. She wouldn't. She probably would act like she didn't even know me. You know who knows, right? But yeah, she was in my band. It wasn't the other way around. Who who from that scene maybe is somebody that hasn't gotten much you know spotlight that you would say, man, that person is amazingly talented or can kill it. From the uh, MPG scene, that whole scene. Yeah, MPG, Revolution, anyone in that scene, Minneapolis. Well, the Revolution was the band that Prince was in. And because that was Purple Rain, it automatically lended itself to like the Beatles, right? Every individual member had their own persona. People liked them for certain reasons, right? The MPG, I've always said, there's a few people, well, everybody, all of them. Anybody, let me put it like this. Anybody that was in MPG when, when I was into the MPG, right? And that would be Levi, Miko, uh, Morris, uh, Rosie, you know, everybody. Tommy, right? Tony, all of those people. The fact that they don't take limos everywhere they go is a testament to a couple of things. Not the least of which being Prince wanted you to be an employee of his. Anything outside of that, he wasn't going to try to do too, too much. Right? So, I used to say all the time, the fact that Michael Bland and Sonny Thompson don't take limos everywhere they go, one, because they don't drive, but because they don't take limos everywhere they go is because they never were either given or sought the next level because they viewed Prince as the level but Prince is just a level music is never music isn't like that music is like this so whatever you're doing you're trying to constantly do it trying to do different stuff right and it was it was what it was right so but what Prince taught us all was this is boot camp when you work with us, you're in the Marines. Some of you are going to go to special operations. Some of you are going to be ninjas, right? 
You're gonna be walking. You're gonna be those dudes, right? Right? But all of you have gone through boot camp. So when I'm gone, take it and go. Don't re try to reinvent the wheel. Don't try to be me. Don't try to do me. You can do all the Prince, you know, stuff on behalf of Prince, honoring Prince you want to. But when you write music, don't try to write what you think Prince fans want to hear. Do you. Because I showed you the key. I showed you how to get in and get out. And don't do like me. Don't do like me. Because stars eventually burn out. Don't do like me. Prince was a, a an encyclopedia Britannica of what not to do. Because most of the people, which, which well, he was aware of, yeah, yeah, and 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 if you're aware of that, then you know, okay, I'm going to take this part of what I learned from Prince, which is a good thing, and I'm going to hold that. I'm going to embrace that, and everything that I view as not so good, I'm going to just let that fly over my shoulders. But the problem is, most of the guys who left his camp, a lot of times they gravitated towards the things that he taught them that were good, but they kept bringing in the bad as well. So it made the, it made the equilibrium off. You know, you have to, you have to give. Music is about giving, it ain't about taking. It's about giving. I used to lose a pound every time I did a gig. I couldn't afford to lose no pound, but I lost a pound every gig, you know? Even at bunkers, I used to come up in there and kill and they were so low energy, so low key, I just started lowering my thing to the point where I was literally sitting on stage and still killing. <laughs> right? But I was there for 25 years just for the chicks, basically. There was nothing else. There was no money there. <laughs> right? Um, right. I, I, I did want to ask you a little bit more about that Maserati record. Um, mm -hmm. Bernadette Cooper was pretty involved, you know. Um, what was your exposure to her and relationship or what what went down there <laughs> first of all let me say the Bernadette Cooper that you saw on the records the Bernadette Cooper on men all pause you know and my hair was fierce and I was riding in a Cooper's limousine right all of that that's who she is <laughs> that's who she is she was a female Morris Day before Morris Day Right? Morris Day was put that way. Prince taught Morris how to be that. Right? Bernadette Cooper, she was gangster because she was in LA in a man's world and she had to learn how to make it happen. She had a limousine service. We said Cooper's limousine, that was her shit. <laughs> you know? She was cold with it. Right? So when she was um, slated to do some songs for that record, she said, Send me that dude. So I flew out to LA. She picked me up at the airport. We went out to Carlos and Charlie that night, hung out, you know, play party. And then the next day we were in the studio killing. And it was just me and her. Just me and her in the studio. I forget what the name of the studio was, but it was it was a well known studio in LA. And we were in there just killing it. You got that one woman? <laughs> right and she said attitude attitude we know you can sing right you'll get your chance to sing sing but on my songs we're gonna it's gonna be all attitude and it was yeah she it, gets it she gets that funk thing for sure oh man she's cold with it right and it was it was a weird time because you signed maserati to motown Barry Gordy tells Mark, yeah, I got you, man. We're going to, whatever you're trying to do, we're going to make it big, right? And then at the same time, Barry's selling the MCA. <laughs> so then MCA comes in with the whole, you know, New Jack swing vibe that was happening at the time. And it just it was no place for us. There was no place for us. And we weren't about to turn into that. They, we did the best we could with the songs they gave us to make them stay edgy, right? But... You know, bands weren't even happening at that time. You know, what? Why did they only release it? In, why didn't it get a U.S. release? Well, a single was released, 
on the radio at least. I don't know if they released it as a single you could buy, but um, Saga of a Man, um, the one by Bernadette, was released as a single. I sang that too. Me and Terry did a little bit of, you know. It was a weird deal, man, because like I said, first of all, I didn't find out until all this was over that Motown, Motown's mindset was get rid of Terry. And I and when I found that out, I was like, man, see, that's bullshit. Because if you get rid of Terry, you got no Maserati. And there hasn't been a legitimate Maserati since Terry was gone. Because Terry was the, the leader. A band is not the sum of its parts. A band is a group of mercenaries that follow a leader. It's Did like they have a, issue with him as an individual or the no, uh, image? No. Or, or I don't know what their reason was. All I know is after the fact, I find out they're trying to slowly ease Terry out. That's why I was like, how am I in L.A. doing two songs with Bernadette Cooper, right? One of the songs I did with... Um, uh, with Bernadette, he flew in for a minute and did a part, and then they flew him out, and then they flew me in with Michael Cimbello, and he did a little piece, and they flew him out, and I was there for three or four days. It was like they were, and I didn't at the time I wasn't even thinking about any of that, but after the fact, I'm like, why are they flying me in? Cimbello you know? was a strange marriage too. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I mean, and the funny part about it is he played with Stevie on the superstition and all that stuff, man. He had the chops. He could have written us some really cool stuff, but everybody was trying to do the boom, boom, pop, da, ba, da, ba, da, pop. Everybody's trying to do the little, you know, new Jack Swing stuff, man. Killed how, bands. It killed how, bands completely. How big do you think Maserati might have been had, um, you know, they not gotten sort of sabotaged to Paisley and, you know, had it gone on its natural trajectory? I don't know because again, that's a big if. If my auntie had balls, she'd be an uncle, <laughs> right? <laughs> I mean, I who knows what would the Commodores have been if Lionel had stayed? You know, what would Prince and the Revolution have been if Prince had stayed with the Revolution for two more years, right? What if Prince had lived to be ninety years old, right? Yeah, but so I I don't know. I I, I here's what I do know though. Maserati. Is nothing without Terry Casey. I don't care who, they can say what they want to say. They can do whatever they want to do. Even Mark tried to put Maserati back together without Terry and it didn't work. And Mark put the whole thing together. He created the monster. He's he's Baron von Frankenstein. And they're the monster, right? And they did some monstrous shit. <laughs> but, but again, I saw them live, right? For what they did, they did it well. Right. But, you know, and I was in a band that would that could kick their ass every day and twice on Sunday. That didn't mean we were going to get a deal. It's all such a. It's all such a weird deal. Right. It's all a lot of factors. A lot of factors. A, a lot of factors. I mean, why is why is it that Dr. Mambo's combo combo been playing at Bunkers for 30 years for 100 bucks? Some of the some of the premier musicians in the world. Michael Bland, Sonny Thompson, Margaret Cox. And at the time, it was me, Margaret Cox, and Mark Lichtai, Blue Eyes Soul Man, one of the baddest dudes it is, right? Johannes Tona on bass, horn section. I mean, we were killing, you know? But things happen, man. People do stupid shit for stupid reasons, right? But again, sometimes it's just a matter of doing what you feel comfortable with. And some people don't feel comfortable with change. Some people don't feel comfortable with stardom. Some people don't feel comfortable with an extra dollar in their pocket. You know, it's, I don't know. What you but still, do? It's the beauty of uh, the internet, you know, that at least you can find some of the yeah. greatest musicians that maybe are not selling or being pushed by labels or whatever. You can still find them if you look for them. Yeah, and, and I remember saying to Prince one time, man, can you believe people can actually do a full album in their kitchen, right? The internet and, and Pro Tools and Logic and all that kind of stuff made it where you can, you can do a whole album in your house. And Prince said, just because you can, I mean, you should. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Yep, <laughs> you're right. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, the music is what it is. I don't care what technology you use. I don't care what medium. You can go all the way back to 8-tracks or reel to reels, all the way up to just digital downloads. It still comes down to what can you do? Are you good? And, and just because you got a hit record don't mean you're good live. Most people aren't good live. Where are they going to get it from? They didn't study nobody. Right? They didn't do no studying. That's just like here in Minnesota. I, look, people say all the time, he's he, that G-sharp, man. He's egotistical. He's assholes, arrogant. Right? Nah, don't mistake my kindness for weakness. And don't mistake my, my confidence for arrogance. I'm confident in what I do because I've been doing it for 40 years, right? And I'm not a rookie. I'm not new at this. I'm true to this. So if you live in Minnesota and you have access to me anytime you want to and you know I want a Grammy, why are you putting records out and you didn't at least ask me to listen to it? Because it's an arrogance level, right? I you gotta knew. Have some, you got to have some swagger in you anyway to leave a lead a band on stage. Trust me, you got to have some swagger to get up in church and say an Easter speech. You got to have some swagger anytime you get in front of anybody. And the hardest audience is when you stand up at your house and sing in front of your grandmother and your aunts. <laughs> you know, because that's a tighter, more intimate audience. That's the reason why Prince would never, if Prince, uh, here's what I'll say. If Prince had lived another two years, just say two more, he would never have done that piano and a mic for longer than one more, two or three, four gigs. Prince could not stand the intimacy of that. It was too intimate. And it was too it was too easy for a mistake to be made. He did not like mistakes. So he's sitting there playing piano by himself. Forced him to do it though. Right? Nah, but he had to do something. He wasn't gonna sit at home. He wasn't just gonna sit at home. Prince was going to end up, in one way or the other, Prince was going to either, either die like he did or he's going to die like, you know, J uh, Johnny Guitar Watson, just die on stage. Right? Well, that's what we're all hoping for at like, you know, 85, 90 years old. That that yeah, but but nobody, but Prince knew. Prince, Prince was mad when Michael died because he was like, he's too young. He died before me. <laughs> Those kind of guys, they like that whole... Um, that whole legendary, yeah, going down in a blaze of glory type of life, right? That's They like that, man. Elvis, Michael, Jimmy, they don't live to be 80-year-old rock stars. There's nothing worse than going to the petting zoo, as we used to call it, to go see an aging rock star, right? 75, 80 years old, black hair dyed, you know, Ronnie James Dio. You know, come on, right? It, nobody nobody likes that. Nobody wants to see that. And that's why Prince was always doing everything he could to be able to still do what he thought people wanted to see because the audience was forcing it on him. We want to see you jump off the piano. Right? We don't want to see you sitting down playing no piano. We want you to jump off it into a split, come back up and say, bam. Yeah, but he, was still he was still pushing the creative envelope right to the end. I mean, he was doing uh, those things with mono neon and, and things like course, that. But, but he was only doing that because you, you, Craig Rice put it best. Everybody's that's a songwriter performer has a story. Once you told that story, you're just repeating the story. So at that point, you got to kind of bring, look, when, when D'Angelo first came out, I said, that dude been studying Prince. If Prince was smart, and again, if my auntie had balls, he'd be an uncle. But if Prince was smart, he should have gone and gotten D'Angelo right then and there, moved him to Minnesota, had him in the studio every day so that he could absorb D'Angelo's vibe and then reinvent himself. Because that's all D'Angelo was, is Prince. If Prince was smart, and if my auntie had balls, he'd be an uncle. When Andre 3000 put out The Love Below, he should have called Andre and said, hey man, come to, come to Minnesota. I want you to come to my studio. Because that was a Prince album. Come to my studio. We're just going to write, you and me. All expenses pay. I got you. Whatever you want to do, we're just going to write. And then the next level of Prince would have been another, another deal. And give him credit. Right? This song was being written by me and Andre 3000. Don't wait till you're 65 years old talking about Mono Neon. 
You know what I'm saying? Well, he you, tried to do some of that, though, with the Third Eye Girl. I mean, he tried to reach beyond. Yeah, but see, but see that was lame, too. And here's why. And I'll just call it like I feel it, right? That was lame, too, because it came too late. He had that opportunity when it was him, Mike, and Sonny. There was no power trio bigger or better. No power trio bigger or better ever. But he, he, it was too loose. It, he couldn't control it. You got Sonny, right? You got Mike, and Prince trying to corral that. You know, it's rock, dude. It's rock. You can't con corral rock. It doesn't sound right when you make it like that. So he just let it go. So by the time he goes to Third Eye Girl, that's just a, that's just his way of coming up with a new kind of deal that he never did. And that's an all-girl band. But then how long did that last? Next thing you know, he's got 15 uh, horn players on stage. Right. I love that early 90s slave era MPG doing the rock and the outlaw kind of stuff. That's and, what I'm saying, because he yeah. was mad. Yeah. He was pissed. There was emotion there, right? One of the things that, that um, me and uh, a friend of mine, Stephen, used to always say, Prince has never stood naked before God. Not one time has anybody seen Prince naked. I'm open. This is me. Except for the Love Sexy cover. Yeah, naked. But that's physically naked. But even then, that was a show. That was airbrushing and everything else. But what I'm saying is, he was never himself. He never gave of himself to the degree that people saw raw, unedited prints. The only time anybody saw that, they probably were backstage, like oh, us sitting and hanging out, doing some just jamming or something. He was just being silly and laughing out loud and eating. Because he never let anybody see him eat. He never see anybody, let anybody see him laugh out loud. Everything was... I want to be perceived as this. I want everything around me to be perceived as such, mm -hmm. right? So I don't want to give anybody who I am because then I got to open up. And if I have to open up, some of them demons, I end up like DMX, right? DMX was the opposite. DMX is the full, not was, he's still alive. It's the full opposite. DMX is always my right foot. That's I am who I am. Nigga, what do you want to do, right? That's, that's DMX. His whole thing was, I'm a drug addict. I, I got crack. So give me crack when I was 14. It's fucked me up, right? You would never hear Prince talk about what he went through in his life. He wanted you to see the thing that he wanted you to see. And I hate that he never got an opportunity while he was young and vital to be who he was. 100% unadulterated. This is me. I'm going to take off the panties. I'm going to take off the thing i'm gonna take off the high heels i'm gonna do the thing right i'm gonna sweat in front of you right i'm gonna whatever because it's it's hard for musicians to do that because we're the, trained the, the closest to that g must be you know some of the times he was just only with an engineer in the studio exactly stuff exactly you know? exactly in the studio with an engineer or uh, after a show or like he would call us out there and we just be in there jamming till four or five o'clock in the morning. And then when he got on the Jehovah's Witness tip, he couldn't even do that anymore. Because then you jam for five minutes and he preached to you for two hours. Right? But I'd be like, hey man, ooh, look at the time. I just go home. <laughs> you know? <laughs> he ran. <laughs> speaking, of Jehovah, <laughs> speaking of Jehovah's Witness, when Kip was in a band with him and there was a little bar um a little Barbara Jasmine's was the name of it downtown. And uh, everybody used to go see um, see um, Kurt and Walt Chancellor and all those guys had a band called Conversation Peace. And I walk in one night and right there to the left, with, and right against the wall was Prince and Kip, right? They were sitting there. So I go over and sit with them. And I'm talking, we're talking. And all of a sudden, Prince was talking about Jehovah's Witness, right? He goes into, I said, Prince, man, I, I grew up in the church, bro. Ain't nothing you're going to tell me that I heard a thousand times. And blah, and he goes into a, what is his name? Whose name? You miss, you miss me. You miss me as soon as you said his. You're trying to give the architect of the universe a anthropomorphic value, like male, female, it. Right? I'm not that. you losing me. You can go with what. I'm not telling you what not to do, but don't try to give it to me because I, I ain't buying it. Right? And he goes into the Jehovah thing. I'm like, well, first of all, Prince. What book are you reading out of? Because from what I know, what I know is the letter J wasn't invented to the 1400s. So when was he supposed to be J any fucking thing, right? 
And then, then we got another conversation about heaven and hell. Are you going to go to heaven? Are you going to go to hell? Blah, blah, blah. I said, man, heaven and hell, they don't even really exist. So you're saying any, any be evil is what I said, look, whoever you believe to be Jesus and whoever you believe to be Hitler, they both can only go one place. They jumped up. Prince jumped up and ran out of the place. And Kip, Kip was like, <laughs> he ran out with him, <laughs> you know, because Prince was the kind of guy who was like a flame, and there are people who were moths, right? Your job was to be a moth to the flame. Don't get too close; you get burned up. But stay close, because some crazy shit could happen. You'd be right there in the middle of it, <laughs> right? So, I, I, I just wasn't that just wasn't my vibe, you know. I knew Prince. How, how do you think? How do you think Morris uh, kept in that space so many years? Oh, easy. Morris will tell you. Craig Rice, who was our manager at the time, when we were both fledgling songwriters, right? Craig Rice told us, working with Prince, hold on. He was like, working with Prince is like working the shake machine at McDonald's, right? You got a job working the shake machine. It ain't your job to decide how this shake ought to be made. It ain't your job to decide whether you get to make shakes one hour and take a break. Your job is to make shakes. And when April, when March, April come around, your job is to make shamrock shakes. It ain't your business to decide whether I've had enough of these damn shamrock shakes. Your job is to make the shakes. So when you work at Prince, you do what he asks you to do. Keep your head down and just do that. And that's what Morris did. Everybody else tried to instill their feelings and their thoughts and trying to get too close and trying to tell him what he ought to do with his checkbook and all kind of craziness. Morris was like, look, this is a job. It's a job. I'm going to treat it like a job. And that's how he treated it. So a little surprising there weren't others that were able to do it to that extent like Morris. I said why they didn't. I know, but they think too much. Yeah, <laughs> you're trying to you're trying to figure out how to game the system. I guess I don't know, but uh, but the bottom line is when I worked with Prince, Prince said I want you to be my band for for I want you to put Carmen Electra in my in your band. And as soon as he did that, I had a meeting with the band. I said guys, we're gonna get on this train, and we know it's the crazy train. We already know it's the crazy train, right? But we're gonna, when it's time to jump off before it crashes into the Atlantic Ocean, we're gonna all jump off at the same time. Well, that's not how it went down, but we all basically all jumped off at the same time. He kept Morris and JP in the band to work with Carmen because his band didn't know the key parts. But then as soon as that fell apart, he got rid of Jason and kept Morris. Right. So, but everybody did, you know, I made more money. Look, my band made more money opening for Prince during that tour. than Morris Day in the time, Vanity Six, Apollonia Six and any other band he worked with made combined. Because I negotiated. I'm a businessman. And I didn't take none of it personal. When it all was over, I didn't take it personal. That's why Prince and I stayed friends. It's business. I know you got to run. Before you do, I want to make sure that you're able to share a little bit about what you're doing now. Okay. Yeah. Um, right now, um, I've been in more conversations with uh, Brown Mark because he's considering um, once everything kind of loosens up, starting Brown Mark and the Bad Boys of Paisley back up because we didn't get a chance to really get a jump start before everything started going crazy. So we're going to do that. And um, me and my writing partner, um, we we write songs for, you know, commercials, television, stuff like that. I've got, I've got a number of placements. Uh, Shonda Rhines, who did um, um, Grey's Anatomy, Scandal, Right, and she's got a show called uh, Station 19. Uh, two of my songs were on the finale from last season. Right, I got a song right now that's on Indeed.com commercial. Right, if you go on my, um, if you go on my um, Spotify artist page for G Sharp, all capital letters, just like you see right there, um, it's got every song you see there has been placed on somebody's commercial or television show and every time I add a song it's after you know they've been placed and I'm, I'm gonna do my own because that's the only thing I've never done that's my own record I'm working on it but I'm not in a hurry because again there's no record industry there's no nobody buys music right and you can do a hundred million 
streams on YouTube and make a make fifty dollars. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a waste of time. So yeah. And I've got a I've got a um I've got a profile on a new social media program pro, uh, platform that gives way more money to everybody who's an artist or creator. It's called discovered.tv. Discovered.tv and look up G Sharp. I've got a profile there and I've also got a profile for my podcast with that which matters most. I haven't been doing my podcast much lately because I don't really want to talk about stuff that doesn't isn't relevant to my personal life anymore because that's just swinging on one side of the pendulum or the other. I'm trying to stay on my own, stay in my own lane lately, you know. So you're more focused on the music you would say now than on that? Yeah, more so than ever, you know, okay. because cool. it's time, right? You know, when this thing opens up, I mean, think about it. What do me and Katy Perry have in common right now? Ain't neither one of us got no gigs. But the problem is when Katy Perry gets ready to go out again, She's not going to be able to get the money she wants because the, the, the uh, producers and the uh, producers, the uh, promoters aren't guaranteeing money like they used to because they can't get you to, they, they don't know if they're going to be able to get 30,000 people to pack inside a place anytime soon. So I can take two or three guys to get together and kill somebody. She can't do that. That's the difference. So we're, uh, it's time to scale back. The history, the history proves that when you get to the point where you scale back, and people that actually do what they do get a chance to do what they do, we win, right? But I'm not in any hurry. Like I said, I make my living doing things other than trying to make sure people think I'm cool. So, but I got a three-year-old, so I have no choice. I have to think about his future, not what I think is cool. So, and consequently, that's that will probably end up being something cool that happened. That's just the way it is, how it works. What, what's your favorite album of all time? Um, I, it's hard to say album because back in the day, most albums only had one or two hits on it and the rest of them were just filler. So did the record company, they came to the label with 15 hits, but the record company said, no, we're going to put two on each album so we can have eight albums instead of one big giant album. But I've got a lot of artists that are my favorite artists, Al Green. Isaac Hayes, you know, Curtis Mayfield, Sam Cooke, you know, Prince is one of my favorite artists, but limited, certain stuff I like, certain stuff I really wasn't into, right? I've never really been a huge Michael Jackson fan. I've always been a Jackson 5 fan. So I, I'm really, in, I'm really different about what I like because I'm a, I'm a funketeer and I'm a soul man. So if it ain't funky and it ain't got no soul, I really don't have no use for it because then it becomes pop. And I'm not really into pop life. I feel you. The corner phrase, if you will. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, hey, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, thanks for having me, talking man. To you, getting to know you better. And thanks for sharing all those stories with the viewers. Thank you, man. Thanks for having me. Take good care and uh, enjoy enjoy that sun of yours. And uh, I hope <laughs> I get to see you out there performing one of these days. You'll see it. It'll either be on real or it'll be online, one of the two. But I'll be playing for real, that's a fact. I hope you enjoyed this episode of Truth and Rhythm. A big thank you goes out to our guest as well as to you, the viewer and listener. Also, much gratitude to Pleasure for supplying the show's funky opening and closing music. As a reminder, you can always access the complete list of linked shows by episode at funkinstuff.net. I urge you to support this program and receive the extra benefits along with that by subscribing to the Funk and Stuff channel on YouTube and sharing it with funk, R&B, and jazz lovers, joining Truth and Rhythm's membership program at Patreon, submitting a donation at funkandstuff.net, buying Everything is on the One, the first guide to funk book at Amazon, shopping at the Funky Things store for cool merchandise at funkandstuff.net, and linking through funkinstuff.net for all of your Amazon purchases. In addition, if you're an artist or anyone seeking proven results-oriented professional marketing, PR, writing, or editing consultation or production, check out the media services section at funkinstuff.net. Also, I encourage you to drop me a line at scottg at funkinstuff.net. I love the feedback, suggestions, guest requests, appearance and sponsorship inquiries, and just talking about my favorite subject, 
groove-based music. For now, and as always, this is Scott Dr. GX Qualfine saying, keep on keep vibing, on vibing to the rhythm of the one.